Hello, Coffee and Combo listeners. It's your host, Liz Bullard. I hope you're well out there. For those of you who are new to Coffee and Combos, this is the podcast where I talk with friends, leaders in the community, and other great conversationalists about things that are happening in and around the Waterbury community and in the world around me. This episode, I'm talking with my friend Dan about what these different political terms mean, such as liberal or conservative, right wing, left wing. You might be seeing these terms thrown around online, especially when having an argument or, as I like to say, a discussion with people. But what do they really mean? And so I sit and I listen as Dan talks and provides some education around these terms. But I also like this conversation because we touch upon freedom of speech and allowing people to talk. And I don't feel that we often do that. We don't listen to understand what the other person is saying. We listen so that we can respond. And so as we try and grow and understand the reasons why people may think or have the beliefs that they have, I think it's important to slow down and listen to understand rather than being quick to respond. And so this episode, I do a lot of listening as I try and understand these terms and By no means do I feel like I'm an expert now that I've talked to Dan, but I rather understand that I have much more reading and research to do so I can fully understand these terms. So again, thank you so much for tuning in to Coffee and Convos, and I welcome Australia and the Philippines to the Convos. So again, thank you guys for tuning in. Continue to like and share and find Coffee and Convos on Facebook and Instagram. Take care. Be well. And remember to think of three things that you're adding to your cup to get you through this day and this week. Thank you, Dan, and welcome to Coffee and Convos. How you been? Doing well. I got my coffee. How about you? Good. I'm drinking like a oolong tea today, and it's really good. I got to get some more. I prefer oo short tea. Ooh. Tell me about that. I'm not. don't think I've heard of that kind. Oh, I'm just being facetious. Said, Ooh, oh, my oh. God. <laughs> you can see why my wife hits me. You're not that, that one. <laughs> Listen, I was all intel. I was going to say, ooh, what is that? Let me go buy some of that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, when we went up to upstate New York and went to a tea factory, I think it's called uh, Hanley Brothers. Yeah. Uh, before this whole pandemic, every summer they'd have a big sale and a giant tent to get rid of their overstock. And they give a tour of the factory where they make the tea. It's so cool. It's so worth it. My, my wife is a tea hound. We're, we found a place was closing in Vermont that we've been to a few times and mm-hmm. clo- it was closing. So we drove four hours to load up the car with tea. So Listen, I can definitely dig that. So your wife is a tea person. What about you? I know you mentioned, you know, you have your coffee. Coffee or, or black tea? That's it. Really? Yeah. So what's like your favorite? So like if you had to go and get like a really good cup of coffee, like how would you take it? Um, Actually, I'd probably go to the Puerto Rican bakery down here in Waterbury. And I think it's East Main. They probably mm-hmm. have the best coffee I've gotten. It's super strong. That mm. or in New Haven Mamoons, the Arabic coffee is really strong. Like really? Just, and I'll just take it black. because it's, it's Really? So... So I think that I think that really goes with your personality, just kind of like bold. Um, you know, you really do just kind of like stand on your beliefs and stuff like that. So I can see you as being like a true purist of like strong black coffee. If I get regular coffee, usually I like hazelnut and uh, mm. a little bit of cream. Nothing crazy. But when okay. it comes to if I want if I need to wake up, it's going to be either Puerto Rican or Arabi- uh, Arabian coffee. Really? All right. And so, Dan, for those of you listening, he threw out two really good um, names. So one here locally in Waterbury and one in New Haven. Uh, it's like Heavenly Bakery or something. You know, I, I love a local bakery. Like when I was a kid, I always wanted to live like um, over a bread shop. Um, yeah. So <laughs> so like I'm still working on that, looking for a bread shop with like some nice apartment on top. That would be a great smells. Uh, the name of the bakery is Bakery Bread from Heaven. It's on East Main Street. 
I got to check that out. So Dan, I thought of you for this episode. For, for those of you listening, um, Dan is involved in politics here locally. Um, he's ran for office. And I thought of you because I've heard these terms thrown around in different type of Facebook discussions or discussions I like to call them, but others might refer to them, <laughs> refer to them as arguments. I hear the air quotes. Right. <laughs> so like people will be like, well, you don't understand you're a liberal or, you know, you're a socialist. You don't believe in America or you want to destroy America. And it leaves me in this confusion of like, well, what do these terms really mean? And I feel like you do a good job of being um, neutral and unbiased and sticking to the facts. And so I really wanted you to kind of join me for this episode and help me decipher what these terms really mean. Well, in the def- in the examples you gave, um, I forget the, the he was either a psychologist. I believe he was a psychologist. He termed them spook words. Um, mm. With those examples you gave, mm-hmm. it's it's essentially just a uh, synonym for stuff I don't like. Mm. So th- they use it in the pejorative sense because it's base it's base tribalism. Um, they just say, well, I don't agree with you. We're not the same. Therefore, you are you are a bad thing. I am good thing. Mm. It's really, I wouldn't even take it seriously. And it's why I've been off Facebook for about three years. Um, I'm sure you have a lot more peace that way. <laughs> yes. Uh, turn off the news. Go plant a garden. That's what I say. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, if you want to know the real uh, definitions, that's a tough thing because we're dealing with... Um, at least in the intellectual field, a lot of uh, a lot of people don't agree that there are such thing as set definitions. Um, so I'm just going to go as the most objective, rational definition of each term, really. Um, and I think that's helpful, especially um, like you said. I think they are definitely being thrown around as spook terms. Because you're hearing this these words a lot, um, this election cycle, where like, again, in the past, I have not really heard these words to the amount, like I've heard, you know, liberal or conservative, um, but some of the other terms w- we'll get into um, are newer. And also in kind of me trying to do my own research, I've seen in history where they might have been kind of like black and white as far as the the qualities, but there seems to be different 2020 versions of these words as well. Right. Um, from your first word, liberal, um, mm-hmm. I do take particular umbrage at its usage uh, towards what would be best described as progressive leftists, because mm-hmm. if you do see what liberalism as a political and moral philosophy is, it mm-hmm. really has nothing to do with pro- modern progressives or even old progressives. I mean, the progressive movement in the early, early 20th century was behind banning alcohol, for instance, which Mm -hmm. is pretty illiberal. Uh, As a moral and political philosophy, it's usually based upon liberty, uh, consent of the governed and equality before the law. Um, Hmm. So if you have a progressive who is in favor of, say, uh, gender quotas in the workplace, or racial Mm -hmm. quotas, that's not liberal. Uh, because you're placing peop- a group above others in terms of law. Uh, so that's where progressivism shifts away from liberalism uh, as a term uh, and as a philosophy. Uh, that's interesting because sometimes when I've heard the term um, liberal being used um, as an attempt to be an insult, people try to make it as if being liberal is about limiting or taking away from one, one group. But from what you're saying, it seems like it's more about ensuring that people have their freedoms, um, but in a way that is not um, oppressive. Right. Uh, so basically, like equality before the law would be inobtrusive, as in it's a limiting principle of government, where it, it. De- it details how government cannot act. Um, but equity, wherein you tr- people try to... Um, guarantee equality in terms of outcome is Mm -hmm. inherently tyrannical because to Mm -hmm. guarantee equal outcome, then the state will have to treat groups of people unequally. 
um, that's the thing about liberalism is in the okay. Western tradition, it it's based upon the sovereignty and divinity of each individual as made in the image of God. And it is foundationally a religious idea. Um, you will not find a lot of people on the far left or progressive mind minded types having, uh, I don't want to be unfair, so I'll be careful. Hmm. You won't see them very much in line with the idea of a religious foundation um, as the explanation for Western liberal values. Which would kind of like make sense, especially as, you know, again, we talk about a separation between church and state. So you would think that, you know, again, by those kind of terms, being liberal would be not trying to say like the right way, but being liberal, at least there'd be more openness to talking about that as it's taking away that religious component, but also um, putting emphasis on the people who actually well, elect the officials. Well, not, um, not, to, not, to get, mm-hmm. not to get too bogged down in it, but even in the New Testament, when Christ says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, mm-hmm. that right there is actually the foundation for separation of church and state. Um, mm. As in, he also said many times, we are not of the earth. Um, so to have a government that is not going to, again, a limiting principle of secularism, where the government can't pick winners and losers in terms of religious fealty, um, mm. they, can only, uh, they can only step aside and let people practice their religion. Which seems fair, you know, I think, because... And I've even like, again, been challenging my own thoughts and my own views. But if we say that, just say Judaism is is the way that we're going to run and govern, that does isolate people that are Christian in faith and say, hey, well, I don't believe that or Muslim or so on and so forth. Right. And And so. mm -hmm. Well, if you do that with any religion, it's going to be limiting to every other one. Because absolutely. If you take any religion at its most fundamental literalist interpretation, it's always very exclusive Mm -hmm. and anything that survives in an ideological or philosophical fashion needs to be exclusive. Mm. That's the way it survives. Um, But marrying it to the state is a very quick way for it to die on the vine, so to speak. Um, Mm. It it just becomes ultimately corrupted. I, I think so. And again, not to get too off topic, but I think we often see that, um, and politicians who um, use the religion card to justify um, oppressing one group or the other. And that like frustrates me because I don't believe that is what religion is. It's not about oppressing another. Um, and so to your point, um, when we involve religion into the state, um, it does become corrupt because people do not use the true religion um, for what it actually is. It, they just use it for their own gain. Right. Well, if you marry it to the state, well, the state will inevitably attempt to overtake the religion. That's mm-hmm. just how it always seems to work. Now, as far as conservatism, it's, yes. uh, it's basically just a, when people use it in a pejorative sense, I believe they're coming at it from uh, the southern, let's say the southern half of the political quadrant, the four quadrants where uh, North is authoritarian and, you know, mm-hmm. and South is libertarian, not big L party libertarian, but just the idea of liberty. Uh, we'll, we'll just say liberal in that sense. And a lot of people cons- uh, believe conservatives, it's a very two-dimensional low definition, uh, but mm-hmm. I'll, I'll humor it for a moment, I guess, uh, where they just feel it's someone who's socially conservative um, they don't want anything separate. Uh, they want to separate the norm from the abnormal. Uh, mm. And abnormal is not at all, in my estimation, a moral term. It's just simple acknowledgement that it's outside the norm. Uh, mm-hmm. there's, there's nothing morally wrong with being outside the norm. And I'd even say it's necessary to have things outside the norm because if you're looking for honest criticism, mm-hmm. you don't go to your friends. You mm-hmm. don't go to people within your group. You mm-hmm. go you push, let's say you make music, you bring it outside your group that knows you and you're able to get honest feedback and criticism. And that's where I Mm -hmm. feel like uh, that's 
why it's not a immoral. You know, it's, it doesn't mean it's immoral to say something is abnormal. Uh, now, as far as modern conservatives go, um, they seem to be, at least in the U.S., I don't know much about outside the U.S., um, they seem to be fighting in favor of freedom of expression. Mm-hmm. Uh, they seem to be fighting in favor of free markets, which is another liberal idea, um, while at the same time being very cautious, to put it in a nice way, uh, of social change. Um which, fair or not, I mean, caution mm-hmm. for a society isn't the worst thing. Um, it's just, it can become too rigid. And just like if something becomes too loose, if you're playing a guitar and the string's too tight, it'll break. Um, mm. If you're too loose, you won't get music. Um, I sort of I like that analogy because I think sometimes when we use these these terms, especially um, liberal and conservative, it is like one over the other. Um, But I think even with you know again some of the other terms we're going to talk about, I think you need a mix because like you talked about, for there to be growth, you need to always have someone challenging something. You know, you don't always want to have your friends agree; you want them to disagree so that you can grow. and just not be the same, right. basically. Right. Yeah. So you don't. For instance, when I get my news, um, I very rarely go to mainstream sources, but I prefer mm. I prefer to split between left and right and make up my own mind because mm-hmm. uh, I think the biggest evidence of bias on an ideological scale is when someone assumes all authoritarian nature is on the other team when the seed of the tyrant is really something psychologically in all of us. Uh, It's like uh, Solzhenitsyn said, a a Russian writer, um, the line between good and evil rests in each man's heart. Uh, It's, it's very, it'd be nice if we can point to a a separate camp and say, Hey, they're, uh, you know, that's where the evil is. If we get rid Mm -hmm. of these separate people, then everything will be good. Absolutely. And I like how you talk about um, conservative because even sometimes when I think about the word, I do think about it as being rigid, like you had mentioned, or um, thinking about what is normal or what is typical. But it seems that there's also some, they pull a little bit from liberal the same way liberal kind of pulls from some of these other terms. It seems like a lot of these terms are intertwined in a sense. Yes. Uh, They wouldn't, for the most part, they're intertwined because the reference scale is only in response Mm. to the zero point on the axis, so to speak. Um, uh, For instance, Steven Pinker, he's another uh, Mm -hmm. psychologist or sociologist, I forgot which, but whatever. Uh, Steven Pinker said some people Mm -hmm. live uh, on the left pole where if you're on the South Pole, every direction is north. If you're on the left Mm. pole, every direction is right wing. It's why you see people like Bernie Sanders on especially Twitter, which is a cesspool, calling Bernie Sanders right wing. It's like, well, that's because they're so far Mm. left. Everything is to the right. Um, So it's very important that our Overton window, uh, as you know, the the Mm -hmm. range of ideas we can speak about publicly uh, Mm -hmm. is as centered as possible. The idea that when conservatives today call for uh, mm-hmm. responsible immigration regulations somehow makes them a Nazi is yes. a very and dangerous idea. That is my yeah. concern when we, again, use these words and we put these labels because I find that um, when you have a group that is talking about, you know, whether it's like human rights or something like that or equality, we attach these words and we attach them as if they are bad, which then skews the whole message and it impacts or it like creates a bias on what people think versus ra- looking at the issue and discussing the issue. It becomes convoluted with um, this fear mongering, for lack of a better word. Mm-hmm. Yes. Generally emotion. Yes. Uh, most people seem to um, 
Thomas Sowell said this. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a no, I don't know him. Thomas Sowell. Uh, he was born in North Carolina. He his family, and this is in like 1940s, uh, mm-hmm. moved to Harlem. Uh, he dropped out of high school, but then uh, went into the Marines. He got accepted at, I believe it was Harvard, and he now teaches in the University of Chicago Economics. Um, he said, the problem isn't that Johnny can't read or that Johnny can't write. It's that Johnny has not been taught how to think. He confuses thinking with feeling. Mm. And, and I honestly, Thomas Sowell is someone I think everyone should listen to. He's up there in age, he's about 90 now. But it's true. People confuse thinking with feeling. Um, so a lot of these words are used in the pejorative because they feel a certain way about the mm. person and they have to put them in a neat box. Um, basically labeled do not listen. And I found it that it, my ideas truly got challenged when I started listening to people I was told not to listen to. And instead of because after the 2016 election, a lot of people were being called, uh, well, basically Nazi. And I would believe it. But then I said, well, let me hear this person. And when I found out that they are not in any sense uh, a fascist person, mm-hmm. I said, well, I better make sure and listen to everybody instead of letting other people tell me who to listen to. And, you know, I think that is such a good point because even like as a kid, um, my mother would always tell me it doesn't cost you anything to listen to someone. It doesn't mean you agree or disagree or whatever, um, but you never know what you're going to learn. And so that's why um, even though people on my timeline, sometimes I think they are (laughs) off base, but it helps me to think and to challenge and to do more research and to be exposed to different ideas and point to view. And I, again, I think that's all about growth. How can we grow if we do not listen to different points of view and different thinking? Um, even when people are not talking about the facts, at least it gives you, hmm, that's another point of view, that's another perspective. And you're either going to stand on what you believe or you might be open to learning something different. Well, we, well, you definitely want to let people speak. That's why freedom mm-hmm. of speech is our first amendment. And people mm-hmm. seem to think that one of the things uh, that I can't stand is that people think it's only amend- an amendment, but it's not. It's a principle. There's, mm. It's an ideal. You let people speak, no matter how stupid or toxic <laughs> they are, because a lot of people, for one thing, cannot critically think internally. It's a very hard mm. thing to do. To critically think, you have to split yourself into different personas and argue with yourself mm. in the best fashion possible. It's not easy to do. So letting everyone speak their peace allows mm-hmm. for peace to occur because mm. they can come out and say X. They haven't thought about it, but they still say X. Mm-hmm. Someone comes along and says, no, why? They go, that's the critical thinking process for them it has to be out in the open Mm. and if we don't have that well then how are we going to solve any problems um i really can't stand when people get banned they banned louis uh, louis farrakhan for instance i don't agree with uh, 90 percent of what he says i still listen to him because i want to know what he thinks Mm -hmm. Uh, he said some outrageously anti-semitic things Mm -hmm. um, but the best disinfectant isn't you don't put something in the basement you want cleaned. You got a dirty mm. rug, you put it outside in the sun. Mm. You let it, you let people see. So they can, I think it's sort of infantilizing that they think that if you hear certain words, you're going to become extreme. Um, yeah. It's almost as if people can't, they're assuming that people can't think for themselves um, just by hearing something else. But Again, I think there is a danger in censoring things because, again, it it all goes back to you are limited. And when you have things out in the open, as you're referring to, it allows for not only that person to think think critically, but us also the, the listener to say, huh, well, maybe there is something there or maybe, you know, it, it just allows for discussion um, and, and growth. I firmly yeah. believe that. 
So uh, under socialism, uh, mm -hmm. now where capitalism believes in the individual's right to hold property, mm -hmm. um, socialism believes the uh, it's really an economic theory of social organization. It mm -hmm. would say that the means of production, like a factory, mm -hmm. uh, distribution, like a trucking company, uh, mm -hmm. should be owned or regulated by the community as a whole. Um, so th the issue with that, which there are many, is um, individuals create. Mm -hmm. Groups don't really create in an economic fashion. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff Bezos, for instance, may have a probably the most net worth of any human alive, uh, but it was him as an individual who started that company. Um, to take away individual rights towards property um, and intellectual property, where would the incentive be to create? I mean, that's just an economic argument. Mm -hmm. But um, So if socialism would be the idea that the community as a whole should control the production, communism would be a step further saying the state should control in an economic fashion production exchange and uh, distribution um okay so, so if you're going to own a store and you want to make it a co-op that mm -hmm. in effect could be um socialism on a small okay. scale i'd say even a family unit uh a nuclear family unit in the western tradition being mother father well let's say two parents and their children it doesn't necessarily have to be mother father but two parents and their children would be a mm -hmm. socialistic construction because one or two adults will be the breadwinners and they determine the resource expenditure amongst the tribe or the family, so to speak. Um, so where socialism is small scale, communism would be large scale, basically. Okay. Because I've heard like socialism, like in communism used as like, um, if we have a socialist society, then they'll say Dan gets to have one bag of potatoes, one bread a month, um, and he, you will not be able to go and buy what you need to buy in a sense. Well, that would be in Marxist theory. Uh, oh, okay. in, in Marxist theory, socialism is a transitional state between the overthrow of capitalism and the realization of communism. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of the middle ground, but that's just in his theory, um, which I would suggest everyone read Mar uh, Marx and Engels, just to at least get an idea of what they're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. It really explains a lot because um, it's sort of the ideological foundation for, for a lot of the left. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily evil. It's just an idea. I, don't really okay. like, to, um, I like that. It's not evil. It's just an idea. I like yeah, that. but it always seems to turn out evil because it's just base <laughs> tribalism. It's just it's just base tribalism on an economic scale. It's just the same old tribalism, and that's why I prefer liberalism myself because it's it seeks to ditch that sort of tribalism, that toxic resentment driven tribalism. But I digress. Um, but no, I, I like that point because sometimes again I've heard those words used together as if they're the same but it sounds like they're they're different it sounds like socialism like you said is um the people deciding how their resources or the communism is more large scale well it's or, a difference or, between uh it's mm -hmm. a difference between consent and non-consent okay so if i had a farm in a socialist mm -hmm. system uh mm -hmm. that's the socialist system would be inherently small between my neighbors and we would negotiate amongst each other I have this many potatoes, you have this many, you have this many uh, bales of hay, mm -hmm. you have this many cattle. Let's mm -hmm. pull together, see what we need, and we can share the profits off the rest. Um, that's consensual. Uh, okay. Communism would be, you have to do this or we okay. send people to your home. <laughs> like, okay. That's helpful. And in some ways, um, you see socialism in your communities, right? So like you might have your neighbors and you're kind of trading and supporting each other um, because there is a lack. So I can see kind of where the benefits are, um, but also how that could maybe neg negatively impact a larger system. Well, here's, um, the, here's mm -hmm. the difference though, is mm -hmm. that um, by definition, it's not just production or distribution, it's and. So both the production oh, okay. and the distribution. So in that voluntary, consensual 
socialism, Mm -hmm. we agree on how much we grow. Okay. Uh, We agree on how much we make. And we agree on how we distribute uh, distribute it. Okay. So like you said, like a co-op, more collaborative in nature. Yeah. Where everything from production to distribution is agreed upon. Capitalism would be, I'm making this widget. And would you like to buy it? And consensually you say, I would like that widget. And you sell 20 million widgets and you keep the fruit of your labors. I mean. Okay. Okay. That's me. And so. Because again, people are like, well, we're in a communist society because again, you are able to have a product and make that cost as much or as little as you'd like. As um, much as the people determine it's worth. Like uh, for instance, mm-hmm. J.K. Rowling, $20 mm-hmm. per hardcover book, people deemed that fair enough to make her the richest woman in England, even mm. richer than the queen. Uh, did she exploit people? As far as the Marxist system would say, yeah, she exploited people. But I don't remember her holding a gun to people's head to buy Harry Potter books. Mm, okay that makes sense okay as far as fascism goes now i've seen floating around from various intellectuals warning signs or um, signs of fascism and they're almost all universally wrong Um, they're essentially just as i said earlier the bias of an individual to place all authoritarian traits on the other team Mm -hmm. is evidence in these frankly idiotic posts where Mm -hmm. none of these things they name are exclusive to fascism as an idea, but it's definitely parts of totalitarianism. Um, The fascism would be, uh, they called it the third way. And it also uh, derived from Marx's theory, um, Mm -hmm. the class tribalism, um, best way to put it is Mussolini himself wrote fascism is nothing without the state, uh, nothing besides the state uh, to paraphrase him. So the hyper nationalism of fascism derived from Marx theory is uh, a different branch of the same tree where communism was more globally oriented. Okay. uh, Where fascism was more the state alone. Um, but largely, uh, for instance, I believe Mussolini's Italy and, and Hitler's Germany took over a majority of formerly private businesses. Um, mm-hmm. They made extreme regulations on these businesses and their behaviors. Uh, if any were found to be working against the state or not in its best interests, they would be completely collapsed. Um, okay. So more authoritarian hugely authoritarian okay um, and yes extremely authoritarian the the um i don't even know how to describe how authoritarian it was where the only real difference from my reading is fascism wanted just the nation state while communism wanted the globe like there's more international than national um, interesting okay so that's helpful that is. And now I'm just thinking like <laughs> all these conversations now it's like, okay, so that's really what this is and so on and so forth. Okay. And you touched a little bit on progressive. Um, can you say a little bit more? Because again, when I hear that word, I think of forward thinking, thinking about where do we go next? Does that sum up progressive? What does that really mean? Well, it, it, <laughs> I think that's on that. Because again, I've heard that term as far as um, people trying to be negative when they talk about um, current politicians or new politicians that have just come in that, oh, they're, they're progressive. Um, Uh, And so they want to. to mm -hmm, and, And so I hear the term as, well, when I've heard it used, I've heard it as they're progressive. They want to get rid of or tear down America as it currently is, or they're being anti-American um, because they want change. But so I, I don't understand really what that means to be progressive or to be a progressive politician. Okay. Well, I think forward thinking is a little too charitable. Mm. Um, you will see, for instance, progressives in academia push for, for instance, segregated graduation. Now, I don't think there's anything forward thinking about segregating people based on race. 
oh. at all. Uh, I would say progressives as a philosophy, progressivism seeks social reform um, above all else. Um, mm-hmm. And for the most part, equity and outcome, uh, mm-hmm. I see a lot of the time. Um, and there's been, it's been around for a long time. People don't realize how long progressive as a movement has been around. Even Teddy Roosevelt um, back in the early 20th century mm-hmm. considered himself a progressive. Um, I'm trying to find the, the way to describe the progressive political philosophy in a non-biased, objective way. Do you think that people that they are saying are progressive truly fit that um, progressive title? Like, do you think that, that the term progressive actually mean it's something different in 2020 terms than it was originally? Not really, no. Uh, for the most part, it sort of is a still rank tribalism. A lot of the time it's, you know, when we hear talk about the inequality between rich and poor, um, mm-hmm. it's sort of, well, yes, there's income inequality, but why won't we speak about effort inequality? Um, mm. There are reasons why certain people are poor and some are not. There's hard luck cases, obviously. Some Sometimes you have no choice of where you're born or who you're born to. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also, like for instance, let's say I refuse to get my electrical license when the time comes. I say, you know what? I don't feel like taking that test. Mm-hmm. Well, I just basically split a timeline in a manner, in a manner where one me with a license is going to earn three times what I earn now. So there's inequality there, but it was my fault if I don't put the effort in to get that electrical license as one example. Um, I feel the progressives largely are in favor of a sa- social safety nets, which are integral to a working society. I mean, they're, you don't want people falling through the cracks because if you have large scale inequality and data does show that crime seems to correlate with inequality in a given area. For mm-hmm. instance, uh, a uniformly poor area will have low crime rates, but a dis- disparate area with a large gap between rich and poor have high crime rates. Um, so they're, I'm not saying their complaints don't have merit. It's just some of the solutions I feel will either exacerbate the problem or not even attend to it in the first place. Um, no, that's helpful because sometimes, again, in, in having discussions or seeing things that are posted, it seems like people are, some of the progressive policies or progressive type of policies people are putting and labeling as socialism. So in, in, in other words, what I, what I mean is um, people are saying it would be like you, the, the instance you said about you not getting your electrical license. So they're saying, well, socialism would say you still need to have what you would have had if you went and got your electrical license. But actually, that would be more progressive where they would say, let's ensure that you get that, um, even though you did not put in the effort, if I'm understanding that right. I think rather it would be let's empower the government to cover for your poor choice. Okay. Rather than, I mean, you can't really help people, can you? And I think that's an unbiased way to look at progressivism is that they seek through government power to enact social reform. But government power only exists at the consent of the government and is only politics. There's only downstream from culture. Um, So if you have poor communities who are largely making poor choices, Mm -hmm. um, there is no Band-Aid the government can apply that will cover those up. It'd be, in essence, sort of a payday loan. You're going to pay for it later. Um, Not to say that government shouldn't exist. I'm not at all implying that. It's... um, no, I but that personally mm-hmm. feel it starts at the individual. 
that that's helpful because again, um, thinking about some of the things that I thought might have been um, socialism are actually progressive. So that's helpful. Or vice versa, something that could be considered uh, progressive could be socialism. Okay. Um, but the idea of social safety nets is not socialism. Absolutely. Those are oh, progressive, okay. progressive ideas. So, uh, oh, for okay. instance, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, he got in a bit of hot water with the prime minister of Denmark when he mm-hmm. constantly, constantly called them progressive states and or socialist states, as he called them. And mm-hmm. the prime minister came out and said, no, we are a mixed economy, just like the mm-hmm. U.S. Uh, we have a capitalist engine that powers social programs. Okay. Uh, the money that's spent, that's accrued for those programs, which are progressive, um, come from capitalism, essentially. Uh, for instance, Denmark doesn't have a minimum wage. I mean, that is certainly not a socialist thing. Um, oh. They have large reserves of oil. A lot of Nordic countries do. It's, they get a lot of their money. Mm-hmm. Um, but they are in no way these Nordic countries socialist. They just have very effective social programs. Okay. That's super helpful. Okay. So last two terms, left wing versus right wing. You talked about that, but can you tell me a little bit about, so left would be, all right, now help me here. Would that be like liberal, socialist, progressive, or no? All right. So due to the nature of social media back when I was on it and Mm -hmm air quotes, discussions that would occur. (laughs) Um, I found that defining left and right was nearly impossible because people don't like to define themselves. Um, So the best I came up with was, and you can invert this for the right. So the left, I would say, is is a desire to flatten human hierarchies of outcome that they see as based on power in order to advance a cooperative economy to fulfill social responsibility over individual responsibility. And I would say the right would be the opposite. It'd be the desire to uphold human hierarchies that they see as outcomes of merit or competency uh, in order to advance uh, a free market economy to fulfill, to not get in the way of an individual's responsibility to themselves, their family, and their community. Um, Okay. That's how I would term left and right. Um, But... I don't think it's as useful as uh, there's another man named Jonathan Haidt who Mm -hmm. wrote the uh, wrote a few books on the values held by left and right and how they are rooted in um, in some way in biology in personality differences. Hmm. Um, So it might be more useful to look at the left and right in terms of personality differences. For instance, the big five Mm -hmm. personality traits. O C E A N, so ocean would be openness, conscientiousness, um, extroversion, uh, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So conscientiousness. Conservatives, mm-hmm. right wingers, are they score higher percentile wise on conscientiousness, um, which is basically organizing things. Uh, mm. Borders is a great example where the right wing. They want strong borders, personality-wise, okay. their okay. mind works like that. Uh, and the left wants open borders, and they're higher in the trait openness. Oh, okay. I wouldn't say, I would, well, let me be fair. I wouldn't say they want open borders. I'd mm-hmm. say they want easier immigration. Okay. Uh, I think okay. it's a misnomer to say the left wants open borders, so I apologize for that. Um, okay, but that's like helpful in terms of the policy and, and understanding what the difference is. And okay, thank you. So, for instance, they found that uh, psychologically speaking, uh, the extreme right wing fascists mm-hmm. uh, have a higher uh, disgust sensitivity. And if you look at the speeches by and the written word of uh, people who claim to be fascist, 
they sure talk about parasites and purity a lot. Um, so this kind of like personality temperament difference that they have where they're concerned with cleanliness to an obscene degree uh, sort of feeds into this ideology of theirs. Um, so I would say definitely check out Jonathan Haidt, uh, H-A-I-D-T. He has a Listen, I have books. a lot of reading I have to do, Dan. <laughs> And I've been reading uh, lately the, uh, let's see, it's from, I believe, Jonathan Popper. Was it Jonathan Mm -hmm. Popper? I know his name is Popper. So it's uh, The Open Society and Its Enemies. It's basically Mm -hmm. about Western liberalism and Mm -hmm. how extremists and accelerationists, accelerationists being people who want to see everything torn down, Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they don't fit into the liberal ideal of free expression. Uh, you, you, as one example, you see people, well, I've seen it, um, mm-hmm. calling free speech and arguing for a right-wing idea when it shouldn't be right or left-wing. Uh, we, mm. should all, we should all want the free the freedom to express ourselves. Because... Mm-hmm. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, I wouldn't want to live somewhere I couldn't express myself. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. Um, in, in talking about that, um, before we get into our last segment, so in thinking about these terms, and um, I can throw them out to you, can you tell me either policies that might be just say progressive or politicians that might be quote unquote progressive or countries just to give um, the the listeners just another example of, or something to look at and say, oh, okay, so this is what might be progressive or so on. Well, you can look at Europe uh, as a good example okay. where Eastern Europe uh, could be seen as more right wing, um, okay. conservative uh, socially and economically and mm-hmm. economically meaning uh, more reliance on free markets, while Western Europe um, is largely progressive socially um, and very much a uh, generally a mixed economy, but leaning more towards a uh, command economy. Uh, command meaning the state dictates heavy regulation and taxation to mm-hmm. pay for a lot of the social reforms. Um, so the dichotomy between Western and Eastern Europe, uh, for, an- for instance, um, Victor Orban in Hungary is essentially an autocrat at this point, uh, Eastern European who uh, basically canceled all future elections to stay in power. Um, and that's on the extreme of the spectrum where s- someplace like, um, let's say, Sweden, for instance, mm-hmm. um, opened their doors to millions of migrants, uh, just like Germany, uh, Mm -hmm. and pay for it with heavy taxation um, for their various social programs, including universal health care. So I would say universal health care would be a um, progressive um, sort of policy um, where the right wing, where the right wing sees more um, in the States at least, a more competitive market will lower prices. Um, okay. So like op- open um, healthcare for all, like, you know, giving healthcare. So that's not necessarily a socialist thing. I wouldn't say so because the, the money used to pay for that is still being powered by a capitalist engine. Okay. That's like said, helpful. Like I said, by definition um, it's production and distribution not okay where a mixed economy would be sort of an or situation okay that's helpful because again in looking at different conversations and things um it it to me ha- was presented as if socialism was also liberalism which was just everyone gets everything without working for anything but it seems like it's much more complex than that. Hugely complex. I mean, I think a lot of people, they take um, they take grand stands 
on large scale issues to signal to their in group their moral superiority while ignoring the responsibility in their own lives. It's like, well, I could be concerned about the world, but I have a family, you know, I have a job, I have to work. And it's funny if, if you ever find yourself around the working class, these things, these things are so esoteric to them, to us. Uh, I've can, I guess I'm a working class schlub as well. <laughs> we, for the most part, in both my runs for office, speaking to close to 2,000 people plus, mm -hmm. the D or the R next to their name didn't matter. And I think that's a big reason for the, um, the current split, the mm. hyper polarization we're seeing is that Democrat candidates only go to Democrat houses and Republican candidates only go to Republican houses. If mm -hmm. they each went to both, like we do as the independents, mm -hmm. you'll see most people just want the same thing. They want a better life for their children. A absolutely. It doesn't, absolutely. And, and for the most part, everyone agrees on what the problems are. It's mm -hmm. just solutions we're unable to find compromises for because we term the other as bad. <laughs> instead of just different, which there's nothing wrong with being abnormal or different. I couldn't agree more. And I, I, I think that's true. If you really strip everything down and were to write everything on paper, everyone wants the same thing. Everyone wants to survive. Everyone wants to ensure that their children have um, a, a future where they can, you know, have more than their parents or, you know, have. And like you said, we are never getting to the point where we can actually talk about how to get there because it's like, let's put one against the other and we are not open to hearing the other side. It's just, let me deem this as wrong versus let's take the best out of both conversations to see how we can make this work. Right. No, that's why you need an open discussion of ideas. Like, mm -hmm. and personally, if you don't defend the right of the worst in your society, then you don't really believe in those rights to begin with because mm -hmm. like freedom of expression, it's not about, it's not for talking about the weather. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not for inane, innocuous conversation. Mm. You know, it's because if you choose to speak, you're likely going to offend someone mm. just about every time. Mm -hmm. you know, you, no one has a right not to be offended. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do have a right not to listen, but that's not wise either. Mm -hmm. but, uh, mm hmm so that's that's about it. I mean, I'm trying to be as objective as possible in these terms. <laughs> just no, it, 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 you did well, and I am just so um, grateful because, again, so a lot of these terms were pinned as being anti-American or um, well, that's a whole not other, patri mm -hmm. That's a whole other conversation because Americanism is a specific set of principles and ideals. Principles are what are foundationally what limit us. Mm -hmm. And ideals are what we reach towards. So mm. when, for instance, someone tries to say America is inherently evil and racist, I, mm -hmm. I personally don't agree with that. And history mm -hmm. doesn't agree with that mm -hmm. because the principles limit us in our ideals. That's why they're called ideals because you can never catch them. Mm. You, you can only reach for them. And every decade's gotten better for every person mm -hmm. since its founding. Um, I mean, though, I've had arguments online with white nationalists, um, and I mean, one, they're just awful, but <laughs> and two, uh, <laughs> they don't understand what America is about either. I mean, that's a whole nother conversation about, I mean, for instance, um, the abolition movement in America started, um, before the f country was even founded. The mm -hmm. first president of the American Abolition Society was Benjamin Franklin. Mm -hmm. I mean, and he was the founder of the founders. He's the one who handed the pen to Thomas Jefferson to write the declaration. Um, mm -hmm. If you just go through history, it, it's pretty obvious that you can't reach something without the ideal being there to begin with. Um, so mm -hmm. if our ideal was all men and etymolog etymologically speaking, men at that time, men, all mm -hmm. people, regardless of gender, mm -hmm. um, if the ideal is everyone is created equally mm -hmm. and the principle is the government can't treat people unequally, 
Mm -hmm. Eventually, those two working in concurrent uh, concurrent fashion will reach uh, the civil rights movement, which, according to Martin Luther King Jr., was uh, cashing in on that promissory note, as he stated. You promised us this, and we're here to cash in. Mm -hmm. And to me, I mean, also it was a religious movement, which is a big thing. Um, That movement would have failed if it wasn't for the principles and ideals that he expanded upon and really struck to the heart of the founding of this country. Like, I mean, it wouldn't have survived in, say, some place like Japan, um, which, uh, having visited there and read some of their religious literature, um, their foundation is more one of conformity. Mm-hmm. And okay. Th- this is a whole other episode to talk about Americanism. <laughs> Listen, to, I'm going to have to have you come back and talk more about that. Um but again, thank you so much because again, these terms are thrown off as well, one is good, one is bad, one is smarter, one is not, one is going to destroy the comp- the country and one is going to grow it. But it really boils down to having a mix of everything, being open to hear different points of view so that we can continue to make progress um, as a society. Right. You have to. I mean, if you want the right to speak, um, you have a responsibility to listen. I mean, there is no rights without responsibility. Absolutely. And I hope those listening, your takeaway is not to choose one as being right or wrong or to think that your position on one of these is right or wrong, but to challenge yourself to be more open to listening so that you can grow and so that we can grow as a society. I think we have stopped listening because we have determined that our way, our our method of doing things is the right quote unquote way of doing things. But as we talked about with all these different movements and different views, they have changed from how they started out to be different and have intertwined and that has made them stronger. Um, And so I I challenge you that are listening to take that and to take that into your life and to listen more and to keep on growing. Agreed. 100%. Dan, before I get into our last segment, which is called what's in your cup, anything else you want the listeners to know, anything you want to leave them with? Uh, I think everyone should really read the Gulag Archipelago from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He spent eight years in a Soviet labor camp. Uh, he has a photographic memory, and he wrote probably the manuscript when released as a book in the 1960s uh, led to the collapse of the Soviet Union in an intellectual sense, where they could no longer, in the academic field, defend communism because the horrors were peeled back for all to see at that point. But yes, the Gulag Archipelago, it's a hard read. It's an extreme, extremely hard read. Interesting. And I think that also goes to the point of how one society might start out, might be good for a time, but then there might need, a change might need to happen. And that's okay. Yes. And I think not one thing is inherently good for the process, country, family, whoever, for all eternity. And I think we need to not be afraid to grow and again, have those conversations. So again, thank you for that. No problem. And so Dan, for this next question, this next segment, it's called what's in your cup. And in this segment, I ask um, the listeners and my guests to name three things that they are adding to their cup to fill them up, to get them through their day and their week. And so while you think about your answer, I'll give you mine. Um, So the three things that I am adding to my cup are um, books, Well, especially since you gave me all those books, but I have a couple books that I have sitting that I want to finish. I need a blanket and I need some hot cocoa. So if I can get my book, my blanket and some hot cocoa, I will feel like I am accomplished this weekend. I will feel like I can handle whatever is coming this week. So that's what I need to fill up my cup. 
Um, what about you? What are you adding to your cup to get you through your day or your week? I mean, first of all, not to get too serious or proselytize, uh, first is Jesus. Um, mm-hmm. um, try to try to get to church every week. And, mm-hmm. you know, the second thing would be sort of in line with that is gratitude. Uh, just try to be grateful no matter what happens. Um, I'm at work and hit my head. Well, at least I can feel, you know, at least I'm, you know, if I'm feeling pain, that means I'm alive. So I'm grateful Absolutely. for even that. And the third is most definitely my family, uh, my my wife and child, uh, just born this past June. Yeah, um, your little peanut. Yeah, Charles Abraham Werner. Yeah. Oh. One of that strong name. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I find myself uh, rushing home from work every day, just you know, so I don't miss any time. But uh, how sweet! And again, that's something that fills up your cup. And again, listeners, I challenge you: think about what fills up your cup. Um, we need that. We need that. Um. And again, talking about what we had talked about this this um, episode, sometimes these get to be very heavy conversations and very heavy ideals. And make sure that you take care of yourself by filling up your cup. Dan, thank you so much. I so appreciate it. No, no problem. I'm glad we got together. Absolutely. I have to have you come back and talk about um, this concept of like anti-Americanism or Americanism and what that means and what that means when people kind of put that on others as you're not being American. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Some people, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, we'll leave that for next time. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you so much. Take care and be safe out there. You too. Nice talking to you. Same.